So we jumped into the project full time 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and since then we've grown like quite substantially. We sort mm -hmm. of launched into 2,500 retail outlets. That's Coles, Woolworths, Coles Express. Mm -hmm. So we're on track today. Again, it's a small business as of now, but in terms of first 18 months, like we'll do revenue this year. Before we get into it, I'd like to chat about today's sponsor, VitaDrop. I've been using the VitaDrop sleep product for about a year now, and it absolutely blew me away the first time I used it. I looked at my sleep tracker and it had a 30% increase in my REM sleep. I'm somebody who spends a lot of time trying to optimize my sleep, and I'd never seen anything like that. I remember messaging the co-founder, our podcast guest, as well as a good friend of mine, Charlie, about it the next day, completely blown away. So they have four different products for four different day-to-day -day experiences. One of them being sleep, the next one being hydration, the third one being focus, and the fourth one being a collagen supplement. You can grab them both in ready to drink and in sachets that you mix with water. So if you're interested, use the code TOT in the description below to get 25% off your next order. All right, yeah. Charlie. Adam. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Fuck, that was the most nice rogue way to start yeah. this I just thing. thought I'd loosen you up. I thought you needed to be loosened up a little bit. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I'm supposed to be the host loosening you up. But yeah, I know. That's it's, right. going the, it's going I'm the other direction. control freak. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, well, for the listeners, I just yeah. want to give a bit of context of us. Like, you are a bit of an inspiration to me, man. You're, oh, you know, you're you, building man. a really, really cool business with Fighter Drop. Um, we met on our little soiree between Coastal Jam, the festival I run, and <clears throat> Vitadrop as a sponsor. Um, and the reason why you know, I was chatting to your co-founder, Dan, earlier, the reason why I did that was because I think you're in a really smart position long-term with the direction that I think people are moving on their beverage consumption. Yep. Um, moving away from, you know, hectic alcohol and all that sort of stuff into yep. more, uh, like, thoughtful – Decisions. Consumption. Consumptions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this ties in really well with it. So when I was running events, I was thinking to myself, hey, look, I really want to incorporate more of this stuff into the project. Yeah. And when we first spoke, yep. you know, it was perfect. We got along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that was cool. And then you came down to the event and, you know, for the, for the grand scheme of things, it was a small fish in the, in the pie of like what you do in the sponsorship side of things. Yep. But you were there full of energy, like really yep. keen to make sh shit happen, really keen to make it work. And yep. I was like, yep. okay, you just fucking, you hustle, you care. It was really yeah. nice. So Thanks, man. Of course, of course. So, yeah. And, you know, with the sleep rider drop, I've been, yep. it fucking blew my, <laughs> <laughs> it blew my mind. I'm like a big sleep sleep guy. And, yep. you know, as we've spoken off air a bunch of times, there was like a 30% jump on my whoop. Yeah. Just fucked. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. And then I post started like making a couple of posts about it and I've had people messaging me being like, what the fuck is this? So you're it's on the right product. track. It is a good product. You're yeah. on the right track. So, you know, with that in mind, yep. if you could give me an elevator pitch of who you are, yep. what you're doing, how you want to contribute to the world, yep. what would that sound like? Cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Charlie. I'm one of the co-founders. Do I look over here? Do I look at you? Just it, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Whatever it feels right. <laughs> it's looking into your eyes. Yeah, do it. Um, yeah, so I'm Charlie. I'm one of the co-founders of Vitadrop. Um, slight tangent, but it's relevant to our story. I have a background in biomedical science um, and marketing. I yeah did the biomed science first and then I uh, transitioned my career from that to technology. And then I uh, was involved in a partner in a marketing agency called Studio Techni. Mm -hmm. um, and then Vitadrop for me is actually like a bit of my icky guy. I get to pull together, you know, the scientific side of my brain, the creative side of my brain, um, the salesman sort of aspect and the presenting mm -hmm. and kind of do it all in like a, uh, into a brand that I really believe in the, the core mission, which is um, really to try and reinvent the way Australians hydrate mm -hmm. um, is really crazy statistic that 82% of Australians are falling short on their RDI of water, which mm. makes no fucking sense because- How much water, water is, do you think- Is you meant to drink eight glasses a day, right? What's that in litres? Uh, oh, assuming 250 mils, that's what, like two litres? Okay. Uh, I think that's about right. Like, don't quote me on that exactly, um, yeah. but it's eight glasses of water today a day, right? Yeah. So most people are just literally not drinking enough water, which is super weird, number one. And number two- um, well, it's weird because Australians have access effectively for free to free drinking water, mm. some of the best in the world. Really? 
Pardon? Do we have the best, some of the best drinking water in the 100%, world? 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, yeah, Australia is a lucky country. Like it's, mm. you know, big, you know, a big country, obviously like arid in the centre, but like in the, in the outskirts, it's like a very healthy kind of place to be living mm. in. And drinking water from, um, so yeah, obviously that's like one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like hydration, mm-hmm. but also four out of five Australians don't get their micronutrients from a balanced diet. Like they don't get the right amount of micronutrients from a balanced diet. Like we just don't eat healthily enough as a, as a population. Yeah. So yeah, we we kind of wanted to address both those sort of problems with like a yeah a Gen Z millennial focused hydration brand. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, our products are. Um, yeah, fundamentally supplements, um, but we sort of broadly speak to, yeah, that Gen Z millennial market and we focus in on hydration. We want to gamify hydration yeah. through product solutions and programs. And now we're actually um, starting to dig into actually how do we own the action of hydration through creating water bottles and other tech-enabled devices. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we do it through festivals, direct-to-consumer, and we're in Coles and Woolies as well. Yeah, no, well, maybe digging into the scale of the business, like, if you want to yep. talk about like what where, where you're at and like current revenue yep. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we probably – so we jumped into the project full-time 18 months ago mm-hmm. um, and since then we've grown like quite substantially. We sort mm-hmm. of launched into 2,500 retail outlets. That's Coles, Woolworths, Coles Express, mm-hmm. um, which was hectic. Yeah, I can imagine. But um, to kind of go from zero to that very quickly, mm-hmm. um, like we had a relatively small direct-to-consumer business yeah. comparatively prior. Um, and then, yeah, we jumped into it and created like – six more products and oh no sorry it's actually seven more products since we went into it full time yeah um and then put all those products into so many stores which was crazy so we're on track to do again it's a small business as of now but in terms of first 18 months like we'll do two million in revenue this year yeah financial year yeah um which is really cool um but you know there's actually substantial upside from there um because of the distribution footprint we have yeah um and that's like net revenue. So that's like after all the rebates or the yeah, stuff yeah. from the supermarkets. Like the top line number would be a lot more exciting, but yeah. the supermarkets do kind of take a lot from you as well. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. You can talk about that later and your experience with the yeah. supermarkets and how yeah. to navigate that as a consumer brand. So yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think the issue is with people not being so healthy in Australia? I wouldn't go so far as saying that like people aren't super healthy. I think it's- there's a lot of competing interests out there, right? Like one, like we like simply from a context of drinking enough water, like mm. you just get busy throughout the day and forget. Like mm. it's like, it's not like it's super complex or there's some crazy thing. It's just people crave convenience. They create, crave fun. Like if you look at, you know, what Frank Green uh, or all the Stanley Cups would have done for mm. water consumption, it's just making it a bit more fun and interesting. And then all of a sudden, oh, people do it, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's like, I don't think Australians is sort of inherently unhealthy or anything. Yeah. I think there's just like a lot of, you know, from a brand standpoint, there's a lot of people's attention, uh, there's a lot of attention that's been drawn to, you know, oh, I'm maybe I'll, you know, I'll see an ad for Maccas, right, on on TV and then it gets you a craving for it. And then you're like, oh, cool, I'll try that today. And so it's just kind of like there's so much out there in terms of options for mm. people that underneath all of that, people are often falling short of like key micronutrients. Mm, mm. Um, like I would love to say like I own a vitamin business and a hydration business and I'm like some pillar of health. Like I'm a healthy person, don't get me wrong, but you know, I had four spicy margaritas last night, right? Yeah. Like life gets in the way. You want to do that and you want to have fun. Same thing but with food. you had food. a vitamin drop before bed, I did. Right? I feel fantastic yeah, today. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> and one in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have another product that's like a – B vitamin and electrolyte solution that's very good if you've been on the on on the gas so <laughs> it helps definitely the next day um but you know what i mean so i don't think there's something fundamentally wrong with like australian culture i just think like it's it's very easy to fall out of really really good nutrition habits mm-hmm. um it's kind of like balances a state that you exist in for a period of time mm-hmm. and then you the, the problem with being balanced is that you, in invariably you probably will become unbalanced. Mm. So what we try and ha- say is like, <clears throat> we've got solutions that help you around life, like lifestyle yeah. solutions. So it's like, you know, you don't need to be perfect. That's cool. Like I think this idea of being perfect or, you know, having a perfect diet or whatever like that is is a little bit, um, I guess, fantastical mm-hmm. in that like it's super hard to achieve 
for the bulk of the population. Yeah. Yeah. What's your um what's your goal with fighter drop, do you think? Like when would you be like, okay, this is I'm pretty stoked yeah. on where we've got this to. I think you just constantly reassessing that. Like, so yeah. we set a target of like getting into mainstream retail because our consumers were saying we would love to just buy you on the shelf of Coles yeah. versus having to buy it online and wait a couple of days. Um, so that was yeah. like a goal. So that was, we thought that'd be great. And then now we're here, we're like, well, what's next? So I think mm. um, we certainly are planning on focus, uh, we're planning on exporting the products globally. Like mm-hmm. we've created um, our own formulations and and products. Like obviously I mentioned the the science background, like, Myself and, and Daniel, a co-founder, um, do like all the research ourselves, mm-hmm. test all the products, make mm-hmm. all them with the idea. And we manufacture them in Australia, which is really important to us as well. The idea, the reason we did that versus import something and, you know, take an American concept and, and just like Australian yeah. Australianize it yeah. is we wanted to ultimately, if we could be successful here, which I'm not saying we are, like we're very early in our journey, but like if we can kind of continue to um, – do what we're doing here and sustain the rage, mm-hmm. um, then I think I'd love to be able to see Vita drop in um, a range of other countries as well. I think that'd be very cool because um, ultimately exporting um, like an Australian wellness solution to the world is like pretty cool to mm-hmm. me. So yeah, that's more like from like a, I guess, mission driven sort of position what I'd, I'd love to be able to achieve in the next couple of years. And quite, you know, going to the supermarkets was strategic because once you're there, then people will see your product from, you know, other retail outlets in you know, other countries. So we've had some inbound interest from Hong Kong, for example. Uh, um, but that's come about from being in the, in the major retailers. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. It's, uh, it's a big awareness element to 100%. the whole thing. Yep. As challenging as I'm sure the supermarkets are to deal with yeah. when they've got a monopoly on Australia. Yeah. I've never really heard much of the side of being a product on the shelf. It's really just like a power game, isn't it, at the end of the day? Mm. Yeah, I think they have, yeah, what, like 80% market share of, or potentially even more of like total grocery sales. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they, as a duopoly, like they, they, they wield that power for sure. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, like it's, I don't know, without, I'm not saying that, like they're our customers, like, yeah. like we, we want to work with them. They're our partners, mm. but like equally they're like, they can sink businesses. And yeah. like, there would be so many people that chase that dream of being on the shelf in Coles and like Coles will sink them, right? Because mm. they can't handle the scale and Coles don't give a fuck yeah. if, if, if you can't handle the scale, they're not going to be patient with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like sure. sink or swim instantly. Um, and one thing that I think people don't know is the first 12 weeks in retail is critical. Yeah. So you do all this work and your your head is on the chopping block in the first 12 weeks. So you are- You made it through the 12 weeks, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we did. Thank God. Cool. Um, but who will go by crook. Like, yeah, yeah we-, we <laughs> I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll go, I'll, uh, I'll go through some of the shit that we did to kind of make sure the products got on shelf and then some tactics that we used to ensure that the sales rate was good. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The- My Coles bill was pretty high. For that <laughs> I, can't imagine. I was buying a lot of our own product. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I- but yeah, they're a necessary evil. I think if you're a consumer products brand in Australia, cause they have so much, there's so much dominance in market share and like, there's such reputable brands. Like yeah. people trust us as a, as a brand now because, because of, we're yeah. trusted by them. So there's like that association. That's also, I think really important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it can be hectic. I can imagine. So, so what would, you know, if somebody was trying, was starting a fast moving consumer, that's what it's called, right? Yeah, FMCG. FMCG. I never heard that term until <laughs> I met you. Yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, cool. So that's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It's yeah. a thing. So if someone was, you know, building a fast moving consumer good brand and they're at the point where they may be talking to the major retailers. Like what have you learned from your fuck ups that you would do differently if you were to do it again? Oh, really good question. And like, I think, yeah, if anyone is considering going to the supermarkets or about to go in, I think it's like a matter of um, one getting like, this is sort of, I do, I did have this, but Mm. yeah, like, Anyway, I'll just get into it. So (laughs) (laughs) 
Getting really good advisors. So we work with a really great business called Range. They're our retail advisors. They yeah. were all ex Coles buyers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they they explained what FMCG was for me, for example. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's They're a like, oh, you want to be in FMCG? I was like, what the fuck's FMCG? They're like fast moving consumable goods. So like, oh, look at these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> they like roasted. took me from like absolute peanut to like sort of like slightly salted cashew, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, under, getting really good advisors who will walk you through like what the process is going to be yeah. is so critical because like without that um, or without like, like a really deep background in it, like being a buyer, there's just so much administrative stuff that you need to do at the start, just like yeah. compliance-wise, checks yeah. and things you need to get right. So- so get really good advisors, number one. And then how do you find I did good do that. You just, there's, look, they're there. They're like, um, just, Google just Google people, it. right? Like I, I went on crowdfunding platforms and yeah. and found like other brands that had just launched. And then I was like, well, how do they do that? And then I sort of realized by researching a bunch of them that they were all kind of working with like three or four of these ah, kind of advisors. Okay, yeah, they're like, yeah. oh, we work with this advisor. And I was like, what the fuck do they do? And then I read their website. I was like, that sounds great. Yeah. And then- you got to pitch the advisors to want to be a part of yeah. your story, right? Because they're taking a risk on you because you've yeah. got to be able to pull it off operationally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, get really good advisors. Shout out to Rains. They're amazing. Um, and, yeah, definitely recommend them. Um, and But, yeah, if, they, if they're don't have, if they not taking clients, there's, other, there's some other people that do do it. Yeah. But, yeah, get that right because if you're not from that world, it's like a, just a different language. Yeah, It's I like a imagine. different way of operating. Yeah. Um, and then- uh, I tend to give long answers, so no, no, uh, I, go, yeah, I was so. just going to jump in quickly and <laughs> yeah. say one thing. One thing that I've noticed when I talk to somebody and they say no to me, the thing I say to them every single time now is, "Oh, that's cool. Who would you recommend?" And Man, it's crazy it's a good how yeah, refer on right, yeah, yeah, and it's and yeah. anyone that yeah. says no to you tends to have yeah. someone who's really 100%. solid, yeah, and it, it's just like opens so yeah. many doors in so yeah. many countries now because 100%. you just go. Yeah, it's such it's a really really good piece of advice. It's like, oh, it's a no for now. Number one, it's what way I think. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's a no for now. Like we've yeah. had been told no by investors, retailers, or whatever like that. And we're just like, okay, it's a no for now. Like we'll come yeah. back because we back ourselves to be able to get it done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, back to like mistakes. Um, I think scenario planning, yeah, huge one, right? Like we scenario plan that we would get one of Coles. Woolies or Coles Express, and then we got all three. Okay, we didn't scenario plan for that, and the yeah. scale up was fucking crazy. Mm. Again, I'm going to swear a bit, but no, I swear. I think it's good. You're cool with yeah, that? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. But yeah. yeah. Against your uh, Terms of morals. service. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a god um, fearing man. But it was just nuts. Like just to, to sort of throwing darts at the dartboard and them all kind of landing and then being like, oh, hang on. Actually, our best, that we thought that was our best case scenario, but it's potentially a worst case. Because again, like you can scale up can, and it can just go- it can blow pop, up. Yeah. Right? So you can pop the balloon as you're trying to- as you're trying to expand it out, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, sure. And we got pretty close, I'd say, like to, to aspects of it. Um, like, like I was, you know, because things will go wrong in the manufacturing process, and then the supermarkets don't give a shit. They're like, well, <laughs> we need the product still at the same date yeah, that you yeah, said. Yeah. We're like, oh, but the machine's broken. We can, and they're like, well, if you don't get them in, just don't bother bringing them in. So it's like you have to get it in by that date. So. <gasps> I probably, uh, yeah. Did you sleep? Flew, flew too close <laughs> to the sun, assuming that things would go to plan yeah. um, and not have a lot of contingency factored into it. Like we got it done, don't get me wrong. And like, we didn't just do it and then just make it up as we went. Like we had a bit of a structure to it, but yeah, just kind of planning for what can and can't go wrong. Cause you only get the chance to launch once. Mm. Um, and whilst we launched um, and we got that bit done, we were even talking about it before, like we we were trying to get a, a finance facility to help support the actual money that was required to buy the stock to then put it on the shelf to get paid. Yeah. Um, and we didn't have that. So we had to put all of our life savings into it just to buy the stock. Then we had no money for marketing. Um, so that was also Should something- that- Could have given you all the money I lost on Coastal Jam. <laughs> been better. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I've probably gone a bit sort of- Hod, like you know pieced it together but yeah get good advisors one and then like scenario plan for like like low scale high scale and then like yeah. best case scenario worst case scenario yeah and then flip them around be like well what happens if it's like we grow too fast yeah what happens if like the sale rate's really low because yeah. our sale rate initially was lower than we'd forecast so we then had basically put all these orders in with the manufacturers that we we're working with mm. but then because we didn't have the marketing money to really punch it at the start mm. All of a sudden, we were going to have too much stock, and so it was just a bit of a dicey kind of period um, yeah. because 
we didn't know what was going to happen. And then yeah. when it happened, we hadn't really, I would, to be perfectly candid, planned for like extreme scale up and then like lower than expected um, sell through, sell through rates. So yeah. we had these really big orders and the products sat on shelf for a little while um, yeah. before they started really turning. And now they're turning over really fast because we changed the pricing strategy and a few other things. So you've got a scenario plan like, and then just like, yeah, just run with it as fast as you can. <laughs> once you kind of like, once you do it, you just got to take a risk, right? Like yeah. you can't scenario plan your way out of it being risky. Like it's yeah. still risky to scale up. It's risky to work with them. Um, and you got to just take the risk, right? If you're not good, you can't like, yeah, convince yourself it's going to be perfect by doing a 5,000 page like plan. Like all that will happen is well, what's Mike Tyson say? Once you get, everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face. Yeah. So like you'll get punched in the face and you just got to be able to adapt then as well. Yeah, for sure. I, there's uh, I've, I've read somewhere that risk is what begins when you've gone through the known, no, known risks and the unknown risks are what's left. Mm. And that's what is actual risk. Yeah, the things yeah. that you unknown don't- Unknown unknowns, yeah. Yeah, the unknown yeah. unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and you just don't know. <laughs> like, Mate, you know with your festival, right? Like, oh, man. I mean, I think I knew. I just, <laughs> that's yeah, all other thing. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. I just thought I could do differently. And yeah, but I think there's kind of like a naivety you actually need to have as a founder because like on on the basis of probabilities, like you are you are highly probable to fail. Yeah. But like <clears throat> you need to kind of go- <laughs> Them, not actually, me. I'm, an, I, I, I'm an outlier <laughs> yeah. because like, well, not, I don't think we are, but like you kind of need to like have this idea of, okay, cool. Like that's like what's probable and like that's what's in front of me, but like I can change that. Yeah. I can I can, I can can actually influence what's around, around yeah. you. I think the term is like like having a strong internal locus of control. It's like a psychology term. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like, it's, just, it's the idea of like, if someone sold you no- you're like, I can change them. Mm. I can change how they think about me mm. versus like, oh, that means that's a no. Mm. So it's just like a slight mindset shift, mind shift, mindset shift piece that mm. I think is important as a founder just to kind of, you know, blindly just like back yourself <laughs> to be able to do it. Because if you, otherwise you'll just never do it, right? Yeah. I, yeah. The um, It's funny you say that because I've had this idea that I learned a little while ago that basically you, the people that, huh? no, go on, go on. Yeah. People that um, end up doing really well in the world realize at some point in time that kind of their reality is malleable. Yeah. And 100%. you can change things in your reality with just being able to navigate the world and like understand people and, and yeah. change perceptions. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's bit me in the ass a few times, but no just tends not to exist in my brain. <laughs> it's like- 100%. It's, I think it's important that you, yeah, because like if you're your worst enemy or you're telling yourself no, you're fucked because mm. like there's a lot of other people that will doubt you. Mm. So you've kind of got to like get yeah, develop like an internal monologue that mm. is, you know, like you've got to, you've got to be able to analyze what you're doing and, and be self-critical and that kind of shit. But um <laughs> Sorry, <I'd> move around <laughs> fucking heaps. Too jumpy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I think it's important to kind of like try and come back to this idea of like I don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but I trust me, mm. and I and I trust that I'll do the work. Mm. I'll take the feedback. Mm. I'll learn from it, mm. and then I'll be better for whatever comes my way. And I think that's what we started to realize is that we just jumped into things and learned it, learned it and learned by doing. Yeah. Um, and then the only way you're going to like learn therefore is to do. Mm. Um, and there was no way we were going to know what was going to happen with the supermarket. So we just did it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe that made no fucking sense. No, that, like, made sense. that made sense. <laughs> you just do it. Like get the reps Without in. Without blowing up like, the this house. This is me getting the reps in. Like yeah. I'd, I obviously wanted to jump on and talk to you because I like, yeah, as I said, we get on really well and, and I think we learn a lot from each other, mm. but I've never done a podcast kind of before. Like, I got to get yeah. the reps in. Otherwise, you know, how can I then reflect on what it is and get better, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm basically here to help you think through things that you probably haven't thought through. Yep. On air. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. So- yeah. So what is your deepest fear? <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate you kind of digging into the, the details of that sort of stuff yep. with the, with the yep. Coles and Woolworths. So I think that's really valuable because um, I'm sure there's people out there that are about to make that jump. Yep. Do you, 
it sounds like to me it's a cash flow game just through and through. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. So how would what's a how would companies begin to yep. develop their cash flow? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, chill trying to figure that one out. <laughs> it is like okay, there's like there's there's a couple of ways to kind of I guess address that question. Like <clears throat> you need to get skin in the game. So like you need to sort of save up some money to be able to go to market with any consumer products business. Like you're going to need to buy stock and yeah. then you're going to like put cash in there and then you're going to need to sell it, liquidate that stock and realize the cash. So you're going to like, you have to start. Yeah. Um, and then you need to just, I guess, understand like how the world works in your sort of industry. So mm. say so it's like we, well, I do, the main risk in our business is working capital. So buying inventory, mm. having too much inventory at one time and not enough cash or mm-hmm. sort of that balancing act of how much money do we have for marketing to drive the sell through versus that is a bit of a balancing game. Mm. Um, but you obviously need to get started. Um, and then once you do get started, then if you understand how like manufacturers work and their incentives, you can then start to negotiate and trying to improve the fundamental like, you know, cash position of your business through like, okay, cool. Like, well, I've ordered twice from you and I've paid you upfront in full each mm-hmm. time. Do you now trust me um, to give me 14 day terms from yeah. when you do it? So then immediately you can start, you can buy the product, sell it mm. and then make some cash back before you need to pay the manufacturer. Yeah. And then it's really just a game of like, how do you get your cash flow so that you can try and put as little cash down on purchasing your inventory and then you only you know, pay for the stock once you've sold it really. Yeah. And then you're getting cash flow positive, which is, you know, this kind of, you know, it's, it's definitely possible, right? But mm. you, you're trying to get to that point because obviously cash enables you to invest into other things that'll drive growth, right? Yeah. Um, but then, for example, what I mentioned before is we were trying to get a facility in place um, with a bank to basically give us the ability to buy stock on through, like kind of on a loan credit, them, on yeah, credit yeah, terms yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. And then it meant that we could, you know, buy that stock, you know, it, we wouldn't need to put our cash yeah. in per mm-hmm. se. It would be on, on, on credit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it fundamentally shifts the, the underlying kind of cash flow cycle of those mm-hmm. customers. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously on, down the other end of it is with working with the supermarkets, um, they, they'll pay you on terms. So they'll pay you in 30, 60, yeah, 90 which days, is hard. Right? which makes it hard. But there's, there are other, like, again, facilities out there where you can sell your invoice that you've got from the supermarket um, to, to a bank effectively. And then they'll give you cash early on that cash. They'll give you like, so what we have is again, we have a facility whereby when we've got an, just call it a hundred thousand dollar invoice with Coles, um, we can bring forward 70% of that invoice value yeah. to like they they won, right? Yeah. And then basically when the supermarkets pay, they take their 70%. You know, they take they take 70% and the 30% comes well, they, back to will us. Will they take a do they take a big fee on top yeah, of that? There's it's there's a cost of money, right? So understanding like that as well mm. is important. Like there's mm. a cost, there's a cost of doing business and there's mm. a cost of money. Mm. But you can also mate, and I'm not an accountant or anything like that. So there's probably some way better to like <laughs> learn this stuff from, but I've literally just had to learn this by necessity, right? Yeah. I, I'm just speaking to my own experience and what we've done. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like factoring that cost of money into your margin of your product mm. is a really smart thing to do. Okay, yeah. And then obviously, and that's why I said the incentives with manufacturers, understanding what manufacturers want as well. Manufacturers want cash as well. Mm. So if you've got a, you've got 30 day terms with a manufacturer because you've built up, you can then go, well, if I've got this facility with the bank, um, mm, okay, why don't I ask what my discount is on on my invoice to pay the manufacturer if I pay them on day one? So you're giving them cash flow because that's what they want as well. And then if that discount's bigger than the cost of that money, you're actually making yeah. you're actually yeah. better off. Yeah. So, but it takes a while to get there, yeah. right? Um, and you obviously build trust on, over time. Yeah, yeah, I think it's about building trust exactly with, um, and obviously for us, right, it's a lot easier for me to say like, I'm I'm going to get paid by Coles because like they, they're an A1 sort of, you know, massive, yeah, yeah, mass, yeah, yeah. A1 creditor, exactly. Yeah. Um, so they're going to pay. So it makes it uh, less risky for me to sell those invoices out. So yeah. Um, yeah, instead of Joe Blow down the yeah, road. Yeah, like, you know, some guy owns a bar or something like that. And, yeah. um, no offense to anyone owning a bar. But like, yeah. you know, if it's a smaller business, high risk. Mm. 
Oh, you get, they could go under and, yeah. and that invoice is worth nothing. It's yeah. you know, a bad debt. You go write it off. So yeah. yeah, shit like that. I think understanding how that world works and understanding the points of leverage mm. and then <clears throat> just like communicating and, and being like, well, hang on, can I get a discount on that if I pay you day one? And then, you know, all of a sudden it's just playing the game a little bit, mm. but you got to build it up. I think is, is a key thing. Like mm. it was a scary proposition for us to scale up so quickly. Cause like, it's, I guess, inefficient to scale up so fast. Like you're mm. going to waste a lot of money. Mm. You're going to make more mistakes faster, um, which means, yeah, you can learn faster, but it's also you blow like- up in the process. It can, yeah, you could blow up in the process. So um, yeah, I would probably recommend like building more of a, uh, a stable business with like more of a diversified account base than say we had. Like we mm. had directed consumer, some small accounts and then bang, two, two to three yeah, massive big, accounts. Yeah. So then all of a sudden like that's obviously scary. And I heard this comment the other day. It's like, you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe, <laughs> right? Because like, think about it. Like, it'll just, just fucking go backwards, right? Yeah. So we like, we shot a cannon out of a canoe, weirdly. Like, but yeah. luckily, like, we kind of had some support networks around us that sort of stabilized it. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, you're in a better position. Um, like, you've got existing relationships with manufacturers. You can scale up quickly. You've got to plan all of that. Yeah. And then, And then if you get the deal, you just- you Go. shoot it. Yeah, yeah, you hit the ground running. But on the flip side, right, is like there's a moment in time where mm-hmm. there's opportunities and sometimes you're like, fuck, would I, will this moment come again where the supermarkets or some, you know, person, whoever it is, may want you or your business? And sometimes you've just got to like kind of just pull the trigger because you don't know if you're ever going to get the moment again. Yeah. And that's kind of what we were like. We're like, fuck, this could be hectic. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> um, let's just do it and figure it out. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's that kind of risk risk piece, right? You don't know what the un- unknowns are going to be. So were you sleeping well during this time period? Well, lucky we got a sleep supplement that helps. Oh, but true. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that wasn't a plug. No, like, yeah, mate, super stressful. Super, yeah. super stressful. Um, um, but I don't know. Like, I've got a really, really great relationship with my co-founder, Dan. So I think we, we probably- um, the kind of the further we go in the project, the closer we get, which is really good. Mm. Um, and I think that's like one of those support networks. Like, <clears throat> like I'm pretty intense sometimes and like high energy. You intense? <laughs> Shut up. Um, where Dan is extremely chill, calm, like, you know. He's trying to keep us in the frame. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. mate. Yeah. Um, Dan is extremely chill and calm. So I think, um, you know. I'm not saying he was not stressed as well, mm-hmm. but I think we've got a good relationship that it's kind of like when things get hectic, you know I mean? um, you're not like at each other or fighting. You're kind of like, all right, cool. Like let's team up here and let's, mm-hmm. let's like support each other and like work together. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that was super helpful. Um, and then, yeah, like, I don't know, like you're the same as me. Like I love, you know, exercise and like saunas and ice bars and mm. like just doing all like just simple stuff like that. Yeah. Like whilst it's stressful, like there's ways to disconnect. Yeah. And if you don't just become so consumed in your business and brand and all that sort of stuff, then yeah. it, it you have those release, all those stepping off points. Yeah. Um, my partner Tori is amazing as well. She's a psychologist, which is super helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have this thing where it's like leave work, at work when you walk through the door mm. and then, cause she's got her caseload of like, you know, very unwell kids that she deals with. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like if she brought that home and I brought home my stresses, like that wouldn't be good for our, our relationship. Yeah. Right. So yeah, we were stressed. It was full on, but I was, I was sleeping. We we're getting through it. Cause yeah. you kind of just like, you know what I'm, I'm like, sounds a bit lame, but you're sort of living, right? Like you're like, fuck, who's doing this is, this is mm. pretty crazy. Mm. Like mm. we're the fastest growing hydration supplement, like in the country. Mm. All right. This is, this is hectic, but, that's cool. Like, for a good let's, story. let's celebrate that, even though it's it's hard work right now. Yeah. Um, it's at least if it all goes up in flames. Um, and why I like talking about this now is that we're not like finished. Like, this is not yeah, a success. This is just the like, beginning. this is not like tell me how you built this billion dollar company or something after the fact of done it. It's like we're doing it now. Yeah. Who knows? Like, it may not work out, but. Mm. Like, I think it's cool to kind of talk about it whilst you're doing it. Mm. Um, Do you have so billion yeah. dollar business aspirations with this company? Oh, I guess like the billion dollars. I think it's just like a fucking- It's a fun number. It's a super fucking number, <laughs> It's a right? fun number to say. Nah, I think it's like, 
Millennial no Multimedia. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that yeah, tagline of that bullshit. article was. Oh, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they called me a science nerd. <laughs> science nerd. Are you not nerd. a science nerd? No, I do love science. Okay. I think I'm, I, as a scientist, like, I was good but mm. not necessarily great like mm. i realized that i'd probably add more value to not sit on the r&d side but to actually sit on the communication and mm. commercialization of science mm. um but yeah back to your point why, i don't see why we couldn't become a billion dollar brand like why not like why not us like swiss was created in melbourne blackmore oh, really? yeah swiss sold for over it was like 1.6 billion like mm. five six years ago or something mm. so like bondi sands Epic Australian business, like sold mm. like 450 million last yeah. year. Like it, it happens here and you've got to kind of like, why, why not? Like why, why not us? Right. Like what, what's to stop us? Like we've just got to keep doing what we're doing. We're growing at like 360% year on year. So like, not start. that's not bad. Like, you know, let's, let's just keep going and see what happens. Um, yeah. With that said. Throwing off zero cash. <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with that said, like, I think there's kind of, there's obviously a stepping off point potentially for us, like as a, as a business, like I would, I wouldn't lie if I, I didn't think about the potential exit opportunity that could be in front of us in three or five years time. Yeah. Um, like we already have had some approaches from some pretty big, like kind of like businesses that people mm. would know um, that are interested. So it's sort of like, Oh, okay. You know, maybe there's something that we'll do next um, yeah. that'll, you know, and maybe there is a life cycle to me being the founder and leader of the business that, yeah, naturally sits there versus trying to, you know, chase like IPOing and being a billion dollar brand or something like that. Yeah. So it's just, we'll figure that out over the way. Um, but yeah, I think there's also this, there's like a lot of fun in startup in like zero mm. to wanting something mm. and then like going from one to 10, Yeah, you know? So I think like, so yeah, I was chatting to this guy um, who started Metro Foods um, and um, which is, yeah, that, like they've done an amazing job. They, they, they did all the, protein balls and all that sort of stuff with keep it cleaner. So they were kind of the, the other side of it. I think I've explained that properly, but he sort of was saying that when they kind of got, you know, from 10 to 15 to 20 mil, like that was like quite a different it's journey just, for yeah. them because, you know, you, you didn't know everybody well in the business. You had different HR problems. Yeah. Um, and that there was, there's there maybe a little bit of the fun of it went out of it. And that's not yeah, speaking the, for them. The I think there was developed more. And yeah. It's, less like, it's like, you're not having a beer with your staff, like, and well, not they say you don't, but it, it's just a different, it's almost like a different phase. Right. Mm. So I'm, I'm yet to understand how I will go when we're in those different phases. Yeah. You might hate it. Might not like it, or yeah. I might not be the right leader for the business at that point. Yeah. Um, like could Vita drop a billion dollar business? Absolutely. Like, why not? Yeah. Um, I think it's got that broad appeal, but it's still unique in its own mm. right. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, how have you gone finding doing business in Australia? Yeah. Um, like our products are all Australian made, which we love. And yep. it's, I don't know. I actually don't know anything else, if you know what I mean. So I can't yeah. necessarily speak to, um, what it's like to say, <clears throat> you know, deal with a Chinese manufacturer or like a, you know, you, you know, Kiwi manufacturer, mm. um, just cause I haven't done it. Right. Yeah. So, but like my experience has been, it is tough to manufacture here. Like they don't really like many, and I don't say this cause they don't mean, they don't mean anything wrong, but mm. or uh, anything untoward, sorry, not wrong. Yeah. But manufacturers have different incentives mm. to brands. Manufacturers want to turn their machines on and run them for ages. And a brand wants to do the last thing, right? Because you don't want to sit on half a million dollars worth of stock because yeah. it fucks your working capital and cash flow, as we said. So yeah. I think inherently there is like a disconnect between brands and manufacturers, particularly startup brands. So yeah, it has been challenging from that with that respect, because we're a small startup supplements brand and a lot of the manufacturers in this country with TGA listed products, like our products are listed or, um, you know, not every single one of them, but the bulk of our core of our range is listed on the TGA, which is mm -hmm. the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like those manufacturers, they are, they have very big clients. Like yeah. there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot in it for them to, to work with a small challenger brand. Yeah. Um, which is super interesting. Um, and, and perhaps not necessarily good in the 
grand scheme of things, yeah, right? Because sure. um, like if there's like, you know, if there's not challenger brands in there, there's less competition, there's less choice for consumers, mm. perhaps like, it, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I think it's like, it's good to have new brands kind of coming into the fold. So even when we went into the supermarkets, we thought like the manufacturers would be like, great, like how good they're like, it's you're still small to us. Yeah. Um, Cause we're dealing with Swiss um, uh, and or Barocca or whoever it is. Um, and you know, they're doing, they're in the supermarkets. They're also in chemist warehouse. And how all big the is big Barocca guys. is her? It's big. Yeah, it's really big. We're in we're in the same category as yeah. as we're in the vitamin category. So we're in, you know, all the large incumbent brands like Swiss, Blackmores, Barocca, Voost. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of smaller players. Like most are owned by like multinationals or like mm. they're in big consolidated groups. So like yeah. it's, that's challenging in its own right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's and yeah, is it is it easy doing business in Australia? I don't know. Like it's. It's there's certainly some inherent challenges with like the size of the market. Like it's a pretty small market. It is a small it's, market. It's a bit. It's really like spread out. So like some freight costs are a bit higher. But it's it's super possible. And there's a lot of good good sides to it as well. Which mm. is that you can actually drive down to your manu- manufacturer and sit down and like have a meeting face to face. Yeah. Um, Do you think it's, there's a lot of value in face to face? Hundred percent. Like you have to like. We now have this, uh, you know, um, like I guess mantra or like internal pillar or whatever the hell you're going to call it where we're like we want to treat our manufacturers like investors mm. like we want to give them updates about how we're going you know like are we are we selling well this month or poorly and just just keep take them along the journey because there's such a critical component of your overall proposition mm. that if you try and treat them as like enemies or, or like try and fight with them too much like it's just not going to work for you yeah um so yeah like def- yeah we could probably come back to cash flow manufacturers a lot because it's like that is the bane of my existence, <laughs> like like the marketing and all that sort of stuff. It's like fun. Yeah. Um, and that's super critical and important, but you kind of got to get the foundational aspects of it right. Like, cause that's where you'll come unstuck. Mm. You'll cradle demand. You won't be able to meet the supply. Mm. What do you think of the, um, the Red Bull business model in this kind of space? I think in terms of like a brand, is that what you're sort of talking yeah, about? Like where they, they're, they're, they're just all brand and it's all distributed through- I think channels. one that's so clever, there's like one product, right? Yeah. So like, how good's that? You're yeah. not trying to communicate all the different things that you do and all like yeah, having yeah. that. So the simplicity of like having a single hero product is mm. epic. Mm. And I was speaking to, speaking to, um, oh, and sorry, just going back to something that I'll, I'll, but I think it's super important. Like the other thing I found really weird is like that all the, like la- a lot of the large incumbent brands or like founders, like no one's reached out. Like no one's like, oh, cool. Like you're in the supermarkets, like love what you're doing. Well done. Like where, you know, I think we, you know, we kind of, you know, communicate and, and talk to each other and mm. like try and support each other with what your ventures and, and vice versa. Mm. I did find that super weird. Like not like that. I they don't owe me a conversation or anything like that, but like, it's kind of like there's a bit of a next gen piece kind of coming through. So mm. I did find that really weird that I may, maybe it's the industry. Maybe it's the supplements industry. This um, is probably key to my question about Australia. I think yeah. it's an Australian thing. Yeah, but look, it's it's. I, I want to say why I always said it's maybe the industry a little bit because there are a lot of people around us that have provided amazing advice and support. We've solicited a lot of those mm. relationships for sure, but like I do find like sounds weird the booze industry like people are in the booze industry that's like quite an industry that like does support each other okay um there's a lot of lot of players right so there's big there's small um there's a lot of distribution points Mm. so perhaps it's something in it that they aren't like fighting each other tooth and nail um well maybe it's hospitality led so it's like there's a different mindset yeah it's a different mindset but like so we've got some amazing advisors and shareholders yeah keep going um amazing shareholders and advisors Wade Tiller, who's the CEO of Hard Fizz, who is like yeah, a yeah, yeah. booze guy. Absolutely. I'm not sure if you've dealt with him. He's, he's such a good mate now. He's in a great advisor so yeah. from the booze industry though. Yeah. Um, Richie Penny, yeah. again, um, you know, we co-share an office with him in No Standing and Sohan. But, you know, they're they've, they've, they investors in Hard Fizz and other things. So they've been super helpful. But, yeah, I'm. it is interesting that, the, again, I'm going to come to a point here. Like the only person I have spoken to – and it was really lucky that I got even the conversation and he was like such a legend and like the perfect kind of person to talk to. We were trying to see if he could invest. It was a guy called Steve Chapman. So he was the, um, I think he was the chairman of Blackmores. Okay. 
So, so, and he's an older dude from Sydney, like really cool old guy. Oh, well, with respect to Steve, if you <laughs> don't think he's listening, but um, he Could is be. literally old, right? So, like, you know, he's 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 done the traps, made lots of money, yep. uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But he he was he's probably the only guy from the supplements industry, um, like the, sorry, the TGA listed supplements space, um, that I've spoken to that's been really helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one, and bring it back to your question about Red Bull. We, he, he was really open about the successes of Blackmore's um, and how Blackmore's had bought um, Bioceuticals um, and Bioceuticals have Armour Force. Okay. And Armour Force is their hero product. Armour Force is great. Amazing product, right? But he talked to me about his first question was, What's your hero product? Which one's working best? And I was like, Sleep one's working really well. The energy one, like they're our two together because sleep and energy are like well, well connected. Uh, and, and he just talked about the importance of backing in your hero product because mm. it's like it can you can build your business around a hero product yeah, right yeah. so red bull's a really good example of it they've got one hero product everyone knows red bull mm. like that is enough to build a business on mm. um i think the bay juice guys have done it super well they've got like one product lots of distribution mm. um like you know like i think some founders it's like oh like let's launch lots of stuff uh, yeah, like we've yeah. kind of gone broader with our range but um yeah, that is also what I think about the Red Bull business model that maybe people don't think about enough. It's just like how successful that one hero product really is. Mm. And then in terms of, even though it's fucking horrible for you, it's like full of sugar and like too much caffeine. So mm. it's like not mm. good for you. Mm. Like drink Vita Drop, don't drink Red Bull. Yeah, the yeah, message, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, like it is amazing brand and business in terms of the focus in, in terms of like just driving everyone to buy the one thing. Mm. Um. And, and then in terms of how they distribute it, market it, like, again, incredible. Um, clearly, like, they're a billion-dollar company, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, we do um, look at how they distribute on-premise into bars and festivals, and we're like, let's do that with hydration. So that's kind of a little bit of, like, what we're trying to do is be the Red Bull for the supplements industry. Because, mm. um, yeah, there's – it's not really like a fun experiential supplements brand. Like no, there that sort of doesn't m- make sense, but like yeah. it, it, like you can do it, right? Like we tried to make our drinks tasty. I don't and, see this um, as a supplement personally. From it's a consumer. lifestyle brand really. A, We're selling supplements. So, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it's, it's a, it's like a drink to me. Yep. Um, like I'm not thinking of this and going, I need to have this as my daily. Yep. The supplement. Treat. It's the not sweet, even that. It's, it's just sweetie. like, it's like a, it's a, it'd be an ideal first choice when I want to have something to drink. Mm. Oh, it's tasty as, and um, that's like, that was the other idea is like, <clears throat> you can have like, mm, you know, prebiotic so soda these them. days. <laughs> 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 you can have prebiotic soda. You can have that. Like, you know, what I think um, is that consumers like taste matters like so much. So yeah. like make it taste good. Number one. And mm. then number two, make it like do what you want it to do. Like whether it's, you know, whatever functional proposition you're calling out, yeah. get get taste right because if it doesn't taste good, you're gonna struggle to get people to consume yeah. it regularly. Yeah. So that's where we tried to, we tried to do that. But like also, you can make stuff taste good and not put junk in it as well. Yeah. That like kind of sounds obvious, but <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, it it's not something that's something that's only begun to develop. Yeah. The last few years. Yeah. Better for you, right? Have good things <laughs> yeah. that don't taste like shit. Yeah. 100%. Right. This we're is good. good. Yeah, we're yeah, good now. We're this good. is great. Good. Um, yeah. The, uh, the element of marketing seems you've brought it up a lot of times and I'd be curious to understand how impactful marketing is to the sales of the product. Like, do you see when you do certain campaigns, yeah. just j- everything jumps? <sighs> Cause it's a weird one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like there's probably two parts to answer that. So clearly you've got like direct to consumer marketing, right? Which is performative. So if you get a bit of creative, right? Like you, you nail it. And I think when you nail creative, it's like you've, you've intersected with your community. Like mm. not just something looks sexy, right? Mm-hmm. It's, there's something about like the problem that you're solving or how you're productizing that solution. That's like, they're really like, fuck, tell me more. Yeah. And then they, they motivated to purchase from it. So Clearly, if you get that right, like running a Facebook ad, right, for example, mm. the direct impact and importance of marketing is, you know, that it's, you know, you can literally see, you can, you can, you can see, see yeah, the creative yeah, land, yeah. you can see the audience targeting working and it works. Yeah. With the supermarkets, for example, there's like the old school four P's of marketing, which is product, price, promotion, 
and placement. Yeah. So you need to actually, you need to get those right. So with with respect to that, placement, we were in the right, you know, well, we, we actually want to move our products from the vitamin category to the sports and diet category, closer to where their protein powders are. Um, mm. It's a separate thing, but yeah, that's what we're working on at the moment. Because mm. um, we do think that younger people don't necessarily go to the vitamin aisle as much as they go to the protein aisle. So that's placement. Like, are we in the right placement? Um, but yeah, we did see when we got price point right on shelf, we, we, in, we implemented a pricing change mm. um, to an everyday low price and our, our sales just went crank like that. So mm. you kind of got to get one, get the fundamentals right, and then you got to get the creative right mm. um, as well. So yeah, it definitely impacts and makes a massive difference. It's kind of, without saying it's everything, like it, it like, the best story often wins more so than the best product. Um, stories, everything. Stories, everything. So learning storytelling and in, in thinking about how would you communicate this to you as a, as a potential consumer, how would I have that conversation with you? Um, if I'm going to then, I would start from that, that position, then thinking about what your creative is mm-hmm. versus like just making up some random shit. Like think about like, how do you have a one-to-one conversation with somebody Mm. um because if you get the story right (laughs) yeah exactly if you get the story right and people buy the story the product will almost work better for them as well yeah or it'll the placebo is is a pretty powerful thing so yeah yeah but clearly like you obviously then you can't fudge your wood data (laughs) you can't fudge you know but i think it's more like you now believe in what we're talking about from a mission standpoint as well and so then you tell your friends and then that organic word of mouth marketing is um is the most powerful i think Mm. with referrals well that ties into one of my next questions like what value has influences had have influences had on the business it's a really good question. I think like, I don't think we've got it necessarily right, uh, to be perfectly honest. Like I mm. think influencer marketing can be very, very effective and powerful. Mm. Um, we've just brought on Greta Van Reel to our team who is literally like a preeminent voice or um, thought leader in influencer marketing mm. for a couple of reasons. One, she's a weapon. Num- number two, she was on the board of Hydrolite. So it makes sense to, you know, bring her over to us when so we So what could. does that mean exactly? Like when you say bring her over, what it's actually she, she 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 finished up her tenure with them late last year. I'm sort of become friends with her and we work with her influencer marketing agency or we just started to. Yeah. So I just pitched her the idea of getting involved and then through that we we came up with the idea of joining forces whereby Vita Drop would like acquire Drop Bottle, which mm-hmm. is like – which is her functional hydration water bottle business. Mm-hmm. And then we would then together come to, um, then together we will create Drop Bottle 2.0, Drop Bottle, Fighter Drop. It's all like mm-hmm. kind of just made sense to us. Mm-hmm. Um, but then- So that, she's now got a share in yes, Fighter Drop? Yeah, so she's investing so you, and she's also getting a share in, in Fighter Drop and she's going to be a key advisor and partner for us going forward. Are you going to pay her like is, a, reta- a salary or are you going to it's a, it's a, yeah, it's an advisory piece for okay. shares. Um, yeah. But then that'll, we'll work with our agency in a transactional kind of way yeah, as well. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, she's a yeah investor, money, like cash, you know, and shares yeah. and then uh, ongoing advisory piece as well. It's super exciting. One, because mm. she's, as I said, very good at influencer marketing, um, yeah. knows the space. Um, but yeah, uh, coming back to your original question, I don't think we've got it right. That's, but I believe in it so much that we're, you know, we're trying to really, you know, um, build the war chest and build the right people around us to get it right. Cause it can mm. be really effective. Um, we've definitely, uh, used influences and we have, what we tried to do is get influential people slash influencers to invest in the brand. Um, so we have DJ Watts or not. He's an investor. We've got Chris yeah. Lawrence, who was an NRL player. Yeah. We've got Richie and Janie Penny who have like, you know, followings and they're DJ and, um, Rich is a DJ and a bit of a man about Sydney as well. Yeah. If you're listening, Richie. You got, you got, you got me potentially. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Taking over. We'll do the deal right now. New York. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that was a bit of our strategy to, um, you know, not just transact with them, um, like here's some money, do a post. Like I think mm. that's just being too surface level. Like you got to try and find the right influences. Mm. And then we, our, our strategy was because we, we did a little little bit of capital raising to, when we started going to the business full time um, was like, hey, if we can get some cool, you know, influential people to buy in, then they'll when they promote the product or the business, that there's like kind of a level of authenticity there as well because they're a shareholder. Yeah, like they sure. actually believe in it. Yeah, like- so getting that right, because people see through bullshit. Like, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, like I think using talent is um, extremely um, effective. Mm. Um, and that's sort of been our talent influencer kind of strategy. So I think we've got certain aspects right, certain aspects wrong. Mm. Um, but that's just like figuring it out. Mm. What, what I actually, this is probably my take on influencers, is like you should think about them as like a channel. Mm. So like if you've got a message you want to push out, you know, get your affiliate network or your affi- influencer network and then like push that message through them. And mm. if you can get like, you can turn them into like mini brand advocates as well. Yeah. Then that's, well, that's a, what they then are that, really. Yeah. That's kind of what I would, that's now what I'm thinking we need to do is we need to create more of like a, like a community or an ambassadorship sort of pool mm. so that when we want to push messages out there, push product launches out, then we like mobilize a lot of people at the same time mm. versus like just, ad hoc bits and pieces like bit of a post here or there like i don't really personally believe that that works you've got to kind of have like a very clear strategy <clears throat> understand your audience like you're kind of targeting somebody on facebook ads mm-hmm. like who's their audience is it legit does it make sense for their audience um and then just assessing the costs of getting it out there mm. Like how much do you pay an influencer is always key. Like, is it, are you going to get an ROI? Mm. You know, yeah. is it better just put that into ads? Like well, yeah. they're those decisions you need to make, I think. And if you get them right, it can be effective. Mm. But if you don't get it right, it's just like, it's just like getting Facebook ads right or wrong, right? Mm. You can waste money pretty quickly. I think, I think the best angle for it is finding long-term brand partners. 100%. That are potentially influencers. Like yeah. I think that's the yeah. only way that it yeah. makes sense because then- you grow as they grow, they grow as you grow. It's like- Yeah, skin in the game, man. Yeah. Getting getting them to believe in it, push it. Like it starts out transactional, but then it becomes more like a partnership. I think yeah. that's, if you can get that right, like that's, that's a pathway to success. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So going back to the early days of Vita Drop, um, what was probably one of the most significant challenges- don't want to lose you on the frame. <laughs> um, what was one of the most significant, what are some significant challenges you faced early on and um, how did you overcome them? Okay, so we're in shot. Yeah. yeah, we're killing it. Um, Smashing it. Thriving. So we're thriving. Yeah, <laughs> fuck the word thrive. It's <laughs> such a fucked word. I hate it. We say it sometimes and I'm like, oh. Flirty, flirty and thriving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's you, bro, <laughs> in New York. Yeah, got um, that. No, I'm going celibate when I get to New York. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> not kidding. Bullshit. 75 hard. Yeah. Oh, is, that, is 75 hard? No. No, I'm adding no to it. No nut. Is I'm it? Add to it. <laughs> okay. Call it 75 soft. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, well played. Well played. Um, so a couple of things, right? Like I reckon we're in Vitadrop 3.0. Like yeah. Vitadrop was not what it is now when we started. Vitadrop was- Why don't rigid. we look at the- Oh yeah, no shit. Look at this. This is, this is like Vitadrop 2.0. Right. Yeah. So Vitadrop 1.0 so that was, was the brand. Like, and like Dan, thing. co-founder, mm-hmm. did that. And with respect to him, I think, you know, we've come a long way. Um, and that just shows that you put the work in and, you know, now now look at it. Like we got, I think Which that's one, probably a like better that, that's example. That's a favorite one? I think, yeah, that's uh, like the latest designs that we did. I mean, they look good. They look good, yeah. I think we're, we're actually going to do an evolution again um, this year with some new products that we're mm. working on, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, so- Vitadrop 1.0 was like delivering vitamins to your mailbox, like on a subscription, like Vita drop, vitamin drop. Right, right. Right. So it was the initial kind of idea. It was also to do vitamin infused water. So yeah. like sash, so like vitamin. So it was a bit of a, uh, well, it's not, not a double entendre, but it's like, you know, there was, there was a bit of, there's a few layers to why we liked the name. Yeah. Um, it, it spoke to the business model, but also to the product. Um, yeah. But yeah, like that, that like, we didn't know anything about marketing at the time. Like we did that. And then I did the marketing agency with, with Max and learned a lot about marketing through that. And now, mm-hmm. yeah, now we're sort of like, I think quite good at marketing. Um, but um, that, yeah, that made that flopped. Like literally we did all this stuff, spent so long figuring out and making the product, did all this design. And then we're like, cool, we're going to launch it. And then like no one bought it at all. Like it was, it was, I wouldn't say a disaster, but like, we didn't understand how to acquire customers mm. at all. And we had kind of missed that key step, right? We had product, no market. Um, so that's like obviously challenging, but like at the same point in time, like it was a side hustle, like it was working for another company. Um, there's no like, 
you're not shitting your pants because you got to make payroll. Um, <laughs> you know, like you're that, shitting your pants because you ate you're like, <laughs> you're just like, oh, okay. Like you wouldn't say it's a waste of time, but it's just a matter of then getting feedback. And what we did, right, is we got really good feedback. People liked the product. Yeah. And then we realized that, well, people just don't want to buy a subscription for vitamin, a, vitamin, a really small vitamin brand that they've never heard of. Yeah. So then we've already dropped like, I guess, t- t- sort of 2.0-ish or whatever like that was when we started selling through festivals. Um, get, in, get in touch with the culture. Yeah, yeah. Like just finding other ways to kind of sell, like uh, other, other other avenues to market. And then, um, yeah, like that, that worked. And we started, you know, we brought on this guy, Daniel Graziano, uh, who's an amazing marketer. Um, mm-hmm. He was like the head of marketing of the Udi and stuff. Not at the time, but mm-hmm. he since went on and did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're pretty good at selling stuff. Um, they do sell some stuff. <laughs> sell a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, he, he came on, he started running Facebook ads and the business was like cranking and we're like, mm. whoa, this is super fun. Like we're making sales now. Mm. And then COVID hit. Um, and you know, the business was still a side hustle at that, like around that time I decided to partner with my, one of my best mates, Max Cruz on, um, he'd started a, uh, uh, like a marketing agency startup, but he didn't, he didn't have a partner in it. Um, so yeah, it just kind of worked out that, you know, I was trying to do Vita drop and decided that we'd kind of partner on the agency as well and try mm-hmm. and then bring it all under one roof and, and kind of, you know, get after it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but yeah, so what was I saying? Yeah. COVID hit and basically we started selling really well and then, we couldn't get any more stock because uh, kind of what happened was like all the big supplements brands like took up all of the sup- uh, all of the manufacturing spaces. So we couldn't get stock for like nine months. So all that momentum we built, gone, gone right? And then kind of through like, that time, it became a lot more uh, costly to market online because everyone started marketing online. Mm. So we tried to do it again. We're like, great, cool. We got stock, let's do it. And then the, the um, like the ads just weren't working as well. And we couldn't figure out why. So like- yeah, like it's that sort of chicken and egg, I guess, or like cat and mouse aspect where we first bit, we had like supply and we couldn't, you know, create any demand. Then we created demand and we couldn't have supply. We could kind of get it all right. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty long game then. Like for sure. You've got a few shots years. of goal. Yeah. 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 Like a couple of own goals in there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like seriously. <laughs> Just like, but it's experience, right? Like until you do it. But I think if you kind of, the more you do it, if you enjoy it and you like, you're happy to kind of double down again and double mm-hmm. down again. So like, yeah, then, then, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, did the marketing agency thing with Max for a couple of years and then sold out of that to do Vita Drop because I still had that like burning desire. I was like, you know what? Like I've now like worked, had clients and helped grow their businesses. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I think I can, I think I'm ready to take the jump into, into this and just give it a crack and see if we can make it work. Right. Cause I was like, if I just do it on the side, it, I'm never going to know whether it's actually what I think it is or not. And so that was then Vita Drop 3.0 Yeah, when we, um, we jumped into it and then gave it everything. And then we've somehow managed to keep the demand and supply piece like together. Yeah. And then I guess maybe the 4.0 is what's next, which is this like kind of partnership with, Greta and um, like going international and stuff. So it's just like constantly re reorienting to kind of like what you're focusing on and like mm. what you're doing and then what your kind of like goals are around that. Mm. And just, yeah, it's the same brand name, but like it's kind of been different people, different mm. partners mm. throughout it. Um, and yeah, it's some of it's fucking sucked, but you just got to keep at it, I think. You, you spoke about the products- multiple products and different kind of directions you want to take. <laughs> you want to take I'm it. just going to do it. No, go for it. Send yeah. it. Um, the, you know, you've got a bunch of different products yet. You have been told by someone yep. really yep. solid in the industry that focus on a few core products. And yep. we've kind of gone down yep. the success of, yep. you know, other businesses that do focus yep. on core products. Yep. What's making you go so so wide and are you sure it's the right move? Really, really good question. And we think about that all the time. I think, so we had two products like this one here, which is our like sports recovery. That was in Coles. And we also had the powdered version of this can, which was called our focus powder. Mm. So it's like a neurotropic powder, mm. like electrolyte based. Like everything's got electrolytes in it. Mm. And then like the functional proposition, which is it's base, it's this product, right? Mm-hmm. Like those were on shelf in- in Coles and they weren't selling very well. So we took them off the shelf. So we've consolidated our range. So it's a matter of like, you don't know what's going to work, right? 
We we, we didn't know what was going to be. Like these make the most sense to me. Yeah, they do. They the business is in the supplements. Like we're a supplements brand that has like a cool strategic aspect, which is uh, like okay. having an RTD drink you can try. We want to try and get people taking out powdered supplements. Okay, it's best value f- per serve. Yeah. Um. Gotcha. Yeah. So like the cans is a strategic marketing piece as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like okay. So you you asked me a really good question. Like, should we focus around one product? I think it's. The advice from Steve Chapman was not necessarily like, don't do anything but one thing. It was like, understand what your hero products are and don't get just too distracted from them. Yeah. So it's like, how do you, how do you focus around that? But also build out, like you got to build out bas- basket size, right? Yeah. So you need to, you do need to broaden your range. Like biocidicals, I think that was the example um, that I think they have armor force, right? Most Blackmore's got Armour Force. I can't remember. Yeah, I think sure. what, whatever. That's irrelevant. Armour Force is the is the, the hero product. Sort of saying that you'll acquire a lot of customers off that. Yeah. So like, really get behind that in your early days, and then build out around that. So our solution was sleep and energy are intimately connected. We started with a daily up and go kind of yeah. multi like B, B vitamin, electrolyte, multivitamin sort of proposition. Yeah. Um, and that was to give people healthy energy. Yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> I was like, okay, cool. We, we want to do another product. How do we make that complementary? So sleep and energy, you know, if you're getting, if you're drinking lots of caffeine, you're not going to sleep very well, yeah. right? You're going to feel like if you don't have good sleep, but you take like, if you have poor sleep, then, you, you know, you're trying to take energy products. Like it's probably mm-hmm. not, it's like, you're going to be pissing into the wind a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's like, how do we create a complementary second product that works around this broader idea of like feeling good and having more energy during the day. Yeah. Like the benefit of good sleep is recovering well and having more energy, right? I think to do more. Yeah. So those two sort of are like symbiotic in that, in that, with that respect. And then we've got some ancillary products around them that we've kind of created, like we've created canned versions of that. Yeah. So that supports that, that core, core kind of product and range. Mm -hmm. So we've got a canned version of the energy and a canned version of the sleep. Mm -hmm. And then we've just built out, you know, a collagen one because everyone likes collagen. This one tastes awesome as well. So yeah. it's trying to like maintain focus on the core. And from a marketing standpoint, we spend all our money on selling our core range. Yeah. We, we focus our marketing activities on that. Yeah. And once we can acquire customers on that, then we'll, as a secondary sell, we will then upsell, cross sell mm. um, the the other aspects of, of the range. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the idea is that they all feed into each other mm-hmm. and they're complementary. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. So it yeah. all kind of like try and maintain into to the, the core. Same web, but yeah, yeah. It's so building out a network. Yeah. yeah. Um, like we say that the this is the gateway sup, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the can is the gateway sup to the to the supplement. Yeah. And then you know you might try a can at a bar or at a gym or something like that. You're like Fuck, that tastes great. I feel good. Where can I buy more of that? And you end up on the website. Yeah. And then. Or you, or you find it in Coles. So then yeah. Coles, you're like, great, I really like this. How do I get value? Then you go on our website yeah, and then you buy from our website. And then yeah. after that, you subscribe. And then, you know, then we got you. Yeah. <laughs> We've got your data. For so, you know, man, I think I'm a big believer in like networks and network effects. So we're yeah. trying to create like a network that does Solution. try to consolidate around like a core, the core message of like hydration and then like feeling good or vitality, which is like sleep, good sleep and good energy. Yeah. How do you, how do you manage to do all that with limited resources as a startup though? Find the good manufacturing partners. Uh, okay. um, happy to share one of our manufacturers who I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, Black Label Blending up in uh, Meadowbank, Queensland. Yeah. Um, so yeah, most people wouldn't share who they make their products out. We make some of some of our products there. Um, so we've got really, really good partners in them. They get it. They're like kind of Dean, who's like become a mate of mine, um, who's their founder, yeah. is like just kind of a bit of a crazy – like he's a six, he's like probably six foot six, huge man, like crazy supplements, sort of like guy out of South Africa. So he's just like, he's just a special cat. Yeah. Um, and um, he, he's just like helped and backed and supported us, right? So like he's gone, look, I get you're going to the supermarkets. They want all these new products from us. Because yeah, we, actually coming back to this focus point as well, we actually only pitched the supermarkets two products. We pitched oh, the core range more. and then they wanted more from us. Why did they want more? What was the reason? They liked it. They liked I, I don't know. Um, they they also felt that to succeed, you need to have shelf presence. So yeah. just one product is going to get lost amongst all of it. Yeah. 
So that was important. Um, so yeah, we basically pitched the two Kiro products, Sleep and Energy, and then they wanted, well, Coles did anyway. Coles wanted more from us and that's that's worked, right? Mm. Like as in, we've got a good shelf presence in Coles and mm. it certainly helps mm. with getting visibility on shelf because it's just so much shit going on in there, right? Yeah, for <clears> sure. <throat> um, but yeah, bringing it back to, to good manufacturing partners, like they got it, they, they were a startup once themselves. Um, and then, yeah, some manufacturers, not all, will- will be suitable for smaller brands. Like they will work on smaller batch sizes for you. Mm -hmm. um, it'll cost you more. So there's like a, um, it cost you more per product, but like they'll, they'll reduce their minimum order quantities that you can order from them. To let you get in. Just to get, let, get you going to test the market. So that, that's Dean and, and the, the, the guys there have been awesome to help us like, you know, have a crack at things and, and not over invest in, in things. So just with like a really practical example of that, these cans, we made them, um, this is like a, it's a compostable, yeah, but it's like a film. So it meant that we didn't need to create order 150,000 cans. Oh, nice. We can just like the way that Dean set up his canning facility meant that um, we can- um, Have individual cans and then just yeah, put the film then, on like, the top. It means that reducing them OQ. So it's just like, Thinking through operationally, like if you've got the right manufacturing partners, I it means you I can never then, notice that. No, nah, and it looks really premium and nice as yeah, well. Yeah, you would never notice that. Um, so there's like kind of ways around it, but yeah. Um, yeah, one, yeah, trying to find manufacturing partners that will support you. And it's taken us some time to find good manufacturing partners. Mm. Um, and we have more, but mm. they're, that's, they're just, a, you know, as I said, Dean's a mate, give him mm. a plug. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we, we really value the relationship with them. Yeah. Um, that certainly helped um, us grow mm. uh, and experiment with things. Mm. Um, and yeah, like I, I, I like obviously try not to contradict myself, like building out with a product, a pro product strategy is key as well. I just, yeah, the, the whole focus around that is, I think Steve's example with, with um, Armour Force was it, it just always just, dominated and outsold everything yeah. else. And, and that's they probably great. didn't even mean that. It just, they, it just, it just, it just had a life of its own and, it, it just, and it's a great product, right? So yeah. they're trying to build and find another armor force. Like they're like, they're not going to go, Oh, like, let's not do that. Yeah. But, um, it just, sometimes you've just got to like, it's like the 80, 20 rule. It's Pareto, 80, 20 rule. Pareto exactly principle. The 80, 20 yeah. Rule. It's, it's yeah. just like, it just pops up everywhere. Right. Is yeah. it called the Pareto? Pareto. 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 Yeah. I yeah. kind of know exactly. Pareto but, principle. Yeah. Um, um, I think that's right. It could be like yeah, literally no, it not it. It's, yeah, it's something yeah. like that. But anyway, 80-20 just means like what 80% of your revenue or success will come from 20% of your input or whatever. 80% of your problems will come from 20% of your clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, so, yeah. so okay, so going down the manufacturing thing, I just out of my curiosity. So you're like, I'm going to make this from home. You're going to come up with a bunch of random ideas and then you're going to go to them. Yeah. Hey, here's the menu. This is what I want to make. And now- source all of yep. the product the ingredients yeah. there's, and there's different in. ways of doing it um so there's yeah we can like uh, it's all let's just have let's just say it right like you can you can go directly to a manufacturer or you can go to a flavor house you can go to a formulator like you can kind of go you could make it in your own backyard if you really yeah. want to in a bathtub like yeah yeah cooking up some meth or some yeah, shit right like, the drop. <laughs> <laughs> like you know stir it up in a bathtub yeah. we definitely don't do that yeah. so there's different ways to create a product like yeah and you can just pay someone to do it for you and pl plenty of people do that but yeah. i think we wanted to try and do something unique is that because you have the science background and you, you want probably to a little bit of it like i'm not a time. i'm not like a formulator like making mm. something like tastes really good and like getting the right um like you know uh like preservatives or or, or lack or, or natural sort of preservatives like you know or whatever it is right like or, all the different inputs like you need to find partners to support around that like what mm. we were really good at and what we, we pride ourselves on is understanding what the functional proposition we want for the consumer like how do we give someone a neurotropic benefit with like a, a fo focus sort of product like what do we put in there so we put in alpha gpc mm -hmm. B vitamins are really good for that. So, and, and off you go, right? So, um, like we're good on that front and then you need to find partners who can, who can support around like getting it all to work with their machinery and stuff. So, yeah, yeah you can go to a one manufacturer and they can just manage things end to end for you. And I definitely recommend that if you can find that at the start. Is it much more costly though? Not necessarily. It's a matter of like control, right? So, like if you bring, um, you know, a formula to a manufacturer and you bring all the raw materials and then it doesn't really work in their machinery. 
like oh, it might okay, like right. like you may, might blend some powder and then put water in it and then it doesn't like kind of flow or something like it's just it's a lot of challenges it's like you don't know it's like unknown unknowns you don't know whether that's actually going to work there but if you can kind of control for as little very like little variables as possible yep. by saying like you you tell me like work collaboratively uh, collaboratively with them mm-hmm. it means that there's a higher likelihood of success or, or less error throughout that process mm-hmm. um and then yeah like we will in time we will evolve out of just working in that way like with this year our focus is to bring some aspects of procurement in-house because mm-hmm. it's it is you basically they're going to charge you a higher margin right because they're going to be doing more mm-hmm. um so yeah, our plan. So procurement, what? Procurement means like buying the materials yourself. Oh, okay, yeah. So if you just if I just buy a hundred thousand of these cans off you, <coughs> they've had to buy the label, the raw materials, um, you know, Print, yeah, make yeah. it all yeah, that. So yeah. like they're marking up all the yeah different people around that as well, mm-hmm. uh, or not the different people. The um they're they're marking up you know by like it'd be a different supplier has the, the labels, the can, yeah. blah, blah blah, and they'll mark that up like ten percent or whatever it is, and that's yeah. their right, right? Like because they're taking the risk on you. Yeah. So obviously, if you start buying that, then you then you you save that margin. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to bring that in house because mm-hmm. um, it'll improve our profit margins. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think um, that's what I said. Like if you you can work with some manufacturers that will do smaller batches, but your price per unit will be a lot higher. Yeah. But I think it's just understanding is there margin accretion there for your business? Like will will you if you achieve scale, will that profit margin get to kind of where you want it to be? Yeah. And we tried to basically build our business and protect for cash at all costs. So we took a hit on margin and profitability mm-hmm. initially on the first orders because we didn't want to, you know, in the first 12 weeks get the boot and then be sitting on $200,000 worth of cans. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that's when you're fucked. That's, yeah, you know? that's a whole other level. So it's like no. trying to just like gate different phases mm. um, is is a sensible approach. Mm. Like don't like – um. <clears throat> Yeah, don't like, like over invest and assume you're going to be doing like 10 million cans per month. Yeah. Like at the start, like it's just kind of stupid. So just, yeah, protect for cash where you can and then find partners that will, will work on smaller batch sizes as you're testing the market for your product. Mm. Do, do you think that it's better to be sold out and have way higher demand than to be able to con- constantly fulfill a product? Or is that, a different model with like the fast moving consumer goods. You, you definitely like the supermarkets will crush you if you're out of stock for too long. Cause they're like, there's an opportunity cost for them as well. Cause the products aren't shelf, on shelf. They're not making the money. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> like they like, they think, I think they think about it. Well, I don't know. They think like this, there's is like, how much money am I making per like section? Yeah. Right. So like these are really attractive because these are these retail for $18. Yeah. So if the supermarket sells that for $18 or sells this for four, like what do they prefer? Yeah. That, right? So <laughs> that's why that this is a great business, like the supplements, because mm. you don't bank the margin, you bank the kind of profit off it, number one. So if, you sell, if you're having a higher um, average sell price, you're, it's a better business to be in um, than like, you know, doing, you know, having high margin, like lots of sales, but like the actual net amount of money you net off is, is small. Sure, I understand. Um, yeah, so I think you can create, you can artificially create um, scarcity, right, which is like being sold out. Like or if you haven't directed consumer business, like definitely like doing capsules or selling out strategically here and there can kind of create more hype on your product. Mm. And like that's a good thing. But yeah, you don't, you want to, you want to, you want to um, always be in supply. Yeah, Otherwise yeah. you're like, you're losing potential sales and customers. Yeah. And I think um, people will, people will trade Choose into other else. options yeah, as yeah. well. Yep. You okay. know, like the supermarkets don't just have like a, a neurotropic can from Vitaville. Like they, they, I think they intentionally have a couple options in there. Cause then there's like some competitive tension between the brands as well that they can then leverage. Mm, yeah. <laughs> leverages and just <laughs> everything man. well i'm i'm uh, conscious of time and but i want to ask you a few yeah rapid fires but before we get to the rapid fires um mm. what is some advice or direction you would give like a upcoming or an inspiring entrepreneur <clears throat> who has a passion for something similar to you yep. but um hasn't made any leap to start the business um i would and, and this is certainly my style, like, but like I, I would talk to people. Mm-hmm. 
I would literally find people that have done what you're doing or maybe two years ahead of you or where you want to maybe be in two years, find them and just ask them heaps of questions. Yeah. Like I think whilst <clears throat> perhaps some people don't inbound, like mm. saying, oh, hey, mate, like well done or like here you're doing this, like let's chat. Like I'll sort of do that a little bit here and there. But like, um, like most people, if you reach out to them, will – I think most founders like – and founders have, I think, a obligation to like pay it forward as well and like provide that advice and create like a bit of a culture whereby, you know, if someone wanted to do what we're doing, like should, I, I have an obligation to – if someone reaches out to me and, you know, put my – like if someone reaches out to me, I will literally speak to them. Like, you, yeah, know, yeah. Like, you know, obviously say that here, but I'll do it as well. Um, yeah, like because there's so – there's so much to learn from the mistakes of other people that if people can, can build upon that, mm. even if you're literally going to launch a hydration brand in the vitamin category in Coles and Woolies, like I'd rather that there's smaller businesses supporting each other than fighting each other mm. and that we all take it up to the big guys yeah. um, together because there's there's enough there's enough out there to put food on the table for everybody, you mm. know? Um, so talk to people, number one, is mm. critical. Mm-hmm. Um, and And- yeah, just like try and learn from other people's mistakes where you can. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also don't fear fear failure. Like I think I was saying this to you is like I think that if you're doing the work, you com- like your your learning compounds every day. Yeah, and then like that, there's obviously with compound interest is you know there's that kind of inflection point that hits right at a certain point in time. Like if you're doing the work and you're enjoying doing the work Mm -hmm. there will be those inflection points and it might not be in revenue it might just be in like getting a win here or there more and then like being able to double down on things so i think um don't fear failure because like if you and probably by that extent as well set set like targets that are like um or goals that are like about the input that you're doing like achieving the input as opposed to just focusing on the output like yeah yeah, like not being like uh yeah i want to be ripped like or whatever right like go to the gym three it's like go go to the gym three days a week and and like or just just get your runners on in the morning if you want to go for a run like just really simple things and then (laughs) 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 yeah no i had that with it because i did a lot of running for a period of time and it was like even if you don't feel like it just put your runners on yeah because it's it's like it's weird right it's just like and then you're like you know what i'm the runners are on i might as well walk out the door yeah yeah ah fuck it i'm and all of a sudden you're running right so um just setting some of those things and like breaking down problems. So it's like, I've just got to kind of do that bit and be really like, like positive with yourself around mm. like just doing the inputs and doing the reps. Because um, if you focus too much on the success um, or, or the, or like the, the, like say revenue, for example, and all you define is we're doing a good job if there's revenue there. Mm. Right. Like one, like you're probably missing what's driving the revenue. Yeah. And you could also be like, doing well, but you don't realize why you're doing well. Cause yeah. you're focusing too much on the it's output as opposed, yeah. as opposed to like getting the core things right. And then just yeah. trusting that the rest will kind of work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was involved in a business that was thumping it through COVID. Um, and it was like, everyone was like really stoked. And then um, probably uh, off the back of it, we probably didn't realize what was actually, we didn't spend enough time on, on the inputs cause the success came pretty quickly. Um, and then when the revenue came off, it's like, what do we do? And no one, no one knew what just to focus back onto the core things. What was it? Uh, it was a, it was a direct to consumer paint business called Tint Paint, Random. and it, and it was, um, yeah, it was re- really, really cool, really successful, and it really is the founder DJ is an amazing founder. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like it just still active. Yeah, 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 it's doing really well. Um, and and it's not to say that it was there, there was something wrong there, and and with the utmost respect to to the founders there and the, and the team, like everyone's doing the right thing, but it was like COVID hit and the revenue just went nuts. Mm. And it was like, clearly it was like a little bit brought on by the pandemic. Sure. And then like, it wasn't like, okay, cool. We're doing these really simple, basic things, right. And that's, what's driving that. Yeah, it's external. Um, so everyone was like really excited and, and that, that's, that's great. Like everyone should celebrate it. But obviously, you know, when you took that, that, that equation out of it, it became harder. Mm. And it was like, then it was a different challenge just to get back to kind of like, well, what will drive? Mm. What are those inputs that we needed to drive, drive the output? Yeah. It sounds very similar to the events industry. And now yeah. it, that challenging times now. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. The, the, the golden years, everyone's selling tickets and yeah, yeah. everyone's having a good time. And then 
all of a sudden it becomes harder and it's like, fuck, like, are we actually really clear on what consumers want from an experience? And then if they, if, so I should be distracted. <laughs> um, yeah. Are we really clear on like what creates a good experience? Exactly. Like we've really connected with our customers and then, yeah, I have to, it's, it's harder now than it was like mm. back in 2018, 2019. It was hard right? in 2018, 2019 and, yeah, as well. So, it's like, so now it's just wild. Really hard, really hard. Now so. it's wild. But that's okay. Look, let's, um, uh, one more, sorry, one more quick question. Um, when did you know it was time to go full time into the project? Because that's a big one. People mm. starting things as side hustles and then not sure when to yeah. take the leap. I think um, I, I probably by the end of the, the, the agency days was probably not that happy. Okay. Like I wasn't really, I wasn't like stoked. Like it's obviously a very intense kind of environment if anyone's yeah. worked in a marketing agency or like built one. Like you got to make cash flows always really hard. Like you yeah. got to make payroll every fortnight. Yeah. You're like, you know, bunch of, you know, yeah, you know, young, super talented creatives that are like hard to deal with. Not so much hard to deal with, more like that they like depend on you to like, you know, put food on the, their table yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So there's like a lot of stresses, right? Sure. And then you got clients who aren't paying you on time or whatever it is. So yeah. like, there's an aspect of like it's just tough. But I think, um, yeah, I probably just wasn't enjoying it um, by the end of it, and um, I also just kind of thought about like what my values are and like what I really wanted to do. Um, it was that kind of, I did like the marketing side of it, but like, do I really give a fuck if someone sells more t-shirts or yeah. that? Like, is that like, yeah, like that's great for them and the client, but I'm like, yeah, you know, it's You're like maybe like, like waking up every day in love. With I'm not like, marketing itself. fuck yeah, fashion man. Like that. And, we, yeah. and that's not to say fashion's bad or anything like that. But like, to me, it was like, what were my values and what did I care about? And what were the kind of brands that I wanted to create or be a mm. part of? Um, and, you know, you just have to do the work for other clients because they pay the bills. So yeah. there's probably an aspect of that as well. Um, and then there was just, I guess, the... Um, the the burning desire to just kind of like see whether I could do it. Like, can I actually now with the experiences I've I've had, like I've seen other people do it, like I've worked on other people's businesses and yeah. helped them grow. Can I do that for me? Yeah. And there was probably a little bit of that. And I don't know, I just thought about it, talked to Dan, co-founder, and he was just like, like, like why don't we just, we both were just, it just kind of talking to him. It was like, Fuck, Fuck it. it. If not now, when? Right. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of that in me, as you know, like just, just do it. Like, yeah. what am I waiting for? And I maybe kind of like just all of a sudden woke up one morning and was like, I actually want to get after this. And yeah. then once it was on my mind, I just like had to put the different processes in place to leave the other business and then get into it full time and just kind of go for it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, I tr truthfully, I said, I'll give this 12 months and then we're done. Yeah. So I was like, then if not, I'll just walk away. That's cool. We'll sell whatever we can and then I guess sell the business and then do it. So I was like, we've got 12 months to make it work. Like I'm not going to, like if I can't make it in 12, if I can't really get it going in 12 months, then yeah. it's like maybe, maybe, maybe it shouldn't succeed and that's fine. And I'd kind of resided to the fact of that as well. So mm. yeah, just sort of setting that timeline mm. um, w w was good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Good to know. Um, all right. We'll get into some rapid fires and then I'll get out of your hair. Um, what's been the biggest thing in the last two years that you've changed your mind on? So like, I think the thing that I've changed my mind on, um, over the last two years is like, it, it's the be all and end all to be in the supermarkets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yeah. it is like not as profitable as you think it's going to be. Right. Yeah. But, uh, and there is a lot of good stuff that comes with it. There's a lot of bad stuff as well. So we yeah. keep coming back to those kind of things, but that have been my experience the last little period of time. We're really focusing on our D2C business, mm. direct to consumer business at the moment, because yeah. there's a lot more control. Um, there's a who lot to like maybe, about it. Who knows, maybe like it's a, power, it's a part of the piece that gets your D2C better and gets you international. Like Correct. you don't really know what's ahead. Yeah, don't know what's ahead. You don't and, know who's and seeing it, things. It sounds like all we did last year was focus on getting into retail. Yeah. And they were like, cool, retail is great. Like, all right. This is better though, maybe, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot to like there. So yeah, they, I don't want to contradict everything I've said. Like our business is focused on both aspects, mm -hmm. right? So, but I think, um, yeah, like when you actually, after you get in, they take their margin. There's not much left. Then 
then you pay freight, you pay cost of goods, you ta- you pay for the promotions and the rebates. There's not much left. Yeah. So a lot of work you got to do. And then after all that's chopped off, there's maybe not as much left as you would think. Yeah. But as I said to you prior to this, like it, it is a necessary evil, if you're going to call it an evil at all, that is it drives the volume, it drives the brand awareness, it drives you at, you know, mm-hmm. You know, it drives the relevancy Maybe in market as well. Potential of, to get investors. It's, correct. It's all correct. So it's all part of it. But I think we've definitely realized that it's it's not like the job's done. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? Wow. Fuck. These are good questions, dude. Ever done for me? Yeah. Maybe my mother to give birth to me. Outside of that, man. Ah, that's an easy one. Everyone, you know, ah, a lot people of people go for that, that one. I'm going to cut that one out as the available answer. <laughs> I think it's maybe not the, like one particular thing, but like I had an English teacher, Monty Stevens, at school that probably kicked my ass out of being a bit of like a boysy boy, um, and he was really instrumental in me in shaping kind of my like other aspects of me and my personality in year twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I think about him a lot in like, you know, he was an amazing man. He was an openly gay man at a, a private boy, uh, a private boys school in Melbourne. And, um, just, I don't know, taught me a lot about life through that period. Cause he'd just lost his partner a couple of years before. And yeah, I, I do often think that I'm very grateful to have a very mm. interesting kind of teacher and like in that sort of. That, that moment in your life where you could turn into a little bit of a rat bag, a little bit of a dickhead. Yeah. And he kind of just saw some of that in me and was like, you're better than that. And you're, you're, you can be a really good person. So be that. That's cool. Right. That's yeah. not, it's not. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's not like the nicest thing he did it. Cause, but he did, did it cause he believed in me and thought that I could be a good person. So yeah. maybe that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I like that. Um, what advice would you give yourself from 10 years ago? Don't smoke. No, no, no. I think about it sometimes. It's not a bad like, one, to be I honest. had a couple of C's last night. I was like, fuck, what am I doing? So I know, I know. No, nah, okay. I think um, believe in yourself more. Like I think I present as a pretty confident person now. It wasn't always the case. Mm. Um, and that don't – and also don't give a shit what people think of you. I the think it's one, such bro. a key That's thing, a man. Like, even this, I'm like, fuck, are people going to laugh at me for going on a podcast talking about my story, you know? I think that's Rant. just an Australian thing. It that's is a like little bit. Australian, like, it is a little bit. Don't yeah. talk about yourself. We're all altruistic, yeah. but we're not. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're all the same. And, and, and you know the other thing I reckon? It's travel. So, like, I think I went and did exchange in Amsterdam, which was amazing. I lived, oh, I I lived in Austin, um, Texas, and I – I made some amazing friends there. So I've yep. got friends at American, um, Nate Wynn, who's an investor in VitaJob, yeah. and, and Matt, uh, another, my two best mates when I was living there, they invested yeah. in VitaJob, backed me. Yeah. Fucking love them. They're in America. Yeah. I've got a couple of guys in Amsterdam. But I think they, those experiences in friendships with people from different cultures mm. also, I think, um, is really helped shape my worldview. Yeah. And I think, yeah, traveling more and, and, and experiencing um, those kind of things is is um, also something I'd say do more of yeah. um, when yeah, you're younger. Yeah, see shit. See shit, learn from me, do some weird stupid shit overseas yeah. and yeah. like, but also like make friends with people from different cultures and stuff yeah. because I think it, 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 as you say, like there is definitely some sort of tall poppy syndrome in Australia, but if you go to other countries and you realize it's actually, it's not always like that. Not everyone thinks like that way mm. in Australia as well. So yeah. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Um, if you could only recommend one book for someone to read that would have Lean the most startup. impact the in Lean their life. Startup. The Lean Startup. Oh, shit, in their life. It could be, okay, business. Fuck. Yeah, let's go business. So, okay. so the Lean Startup. Lean Startup. I read it when I got my first job at a tech company. We'll and add that to it, the show notes. So. Yeah, it's so, so important. It just makes you think about um, validation of business, business problems and stuff, mm-hmm. um, like in a very simple kind of way. Like it's a lot of like tech thinking mm-hmm. but it it's very you know i think innovative maybe it's not innovative innovative anymore but like it's a it'll revolutionize the way you think about problems in 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 your own startup right yep. like how, how do you test your hypotheses yeah uh, and i think i naturally obviously with the science e back kind of background you do kind of want to have a hypothesis and want to test it you don't just yeah. believe your own opinion off the bat yeah but it presents some really good strategies to do that yeah um and then for life um <sighs> What's another really good one? I probably read a lot. I've read a lot more fiction than say like self help books. Doesn't have books. to be. It can be anything. 
Um, okay, my the it could the, be a movie. It could be a TV. No, show, no, that be. was a book I read um, when I was probably again. It was sort of around the time when I was doing English with Monty Stevens and that sort of stuff. And it's called Breath Breath by Tim Winton, and it's super cool. Just an amazing book. But like, um, I think I yeah I got a lot out of this the understanding the journey of those characters and. I think like that's what's cool about fiction is you get to kind of um, experience things without the physical risk of actually having to have done them. Like you yeah. get to be th- that character in that world. Yeah. And then that's, you then can learn sort of vicariously through that character without having to do all the shit that that kid did in that book. Mm-hmm. But he loved surfing. I loved surfing growing up and um, it was just, it's a really cool book. So yeah, those two. Cool. And uh, is there anything you're excited about at the moment that you'd like the listeners to yeah. be in on? Yeah, so we're, we've brought Greta on on board, which is really, really cool. I think she's like, I wouldn't say the missing piece, but like she's going to be a really exciting kind of part of our next chapter. Mm-hmm. And through that, we're investing, we're, we're doing a, an investment round mm-hmm. um, on Venture Crowd, which is like a crowdfunding platform. Mm-hmm. And I would recommend everybody out there not to look at our deal, but to consider – going to like a crowdfunding platform or something like that, finding alternate ways of bringing capital into the business than yeah. like, than just trying to find a big venture capital investor. Yeah. Like there's that they're the venture guys, legends um, definitely recommend them. Like I chose them uh, over other competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's an exciting thing for us. Like our EOI is live at the moment. I think you said you may be interested in it, which is cool. So check that out. Um, not just to potentially invest or, or look at our deal, but like, it's just a cool way to think about bringing money into the business. You need to grow. Yeah. Like just scrap all the traditional ways of speaking to finance guys in like Collins street or, or whatever it is in Melbourne in suits. It's like just a digital and kind of progressive way of doing that. Yeah. Well, it, it changes it. It's a lot more of a marketing exercise, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You need to have a big marketing yeah. push. You need to understand how to market to, to do it, but that will support that. And there's partners. Uh, we're working with this, girl uh lady um pippa smith yeah so she's an absolute weapon so if you do end up choosing crowdfunding like we can put her we'll put her business in the show notes as yeah. well she's yep. an absolute legend so yeah nice yeah uh and and sorry just so i'm clear on that sure i know how marketing like well like i've have some credibility in that sense yep. i'm still getting an advisor in to sp- who she is and she helps me with advertising the deal as well because it's like, it's such a niche thing. So I yeah. think like, even me, I'm like, oh, I know how to do it. I'm like, get the right people involved if you're going to try and bring in, like we're trying to bring in one and a half million dollars. Like yeah. I don't want to fuck that up. Like yeah, I want to yeah, get that sure. money and get it right. You know? Yeah, yeah. for sure. And uh, where can people find you or the business and the business if they're interested yeah. in exploring more? So you can find us at Coles, Woolies, Coles Express. But if you want to buy the products, buy them from me online <laughs> <laughs> at Charlie Wood Nutter at vitadrop.com.au. Yeah. Um, that's our online web shop and yeah. um yeah you can learn more about the brand there yeah and you your social media if you want to share any of that stuff are you mate a- i'm not trendy like <laughs> you i'm like i think i'm chuck a wood <laughs> i got a bunch of shit photos on there um but yeah go to vita uh at vita if you want to learn about the business yeah brilliant and um the last question for the podcast is what do you think the meaning of life is hmm it's a really good question it's a really good question. I think like probably pretty fucking fluffy, right? But I think like I'm like I, I think like uh, do I think there's something out there that's bigger than us? Mm-hmm. Like I think potentially like you can kind of be agnostic and still be a scientist and you know believe in like kind of cool woo woo shit as well. What the fuck am I saying? Um, <laughs> I. <laughs> I, I think humans inherently are like kind of we're an animal, right? Like we've got our own innate desires and that. I think it's like community and family yeah. and love like is at the end of the day, that is, that's what matters. So like obviously work my ass off in the business and do that sort of stuff, but it's like, it's for my family. Like I want to be able to support my family like as they are now, but in the future as well. So like yeah. coming back to that, I think super important. And that's, I think for me, what matters to me and therefore what I think the meaning of life is. Cool. Uh, a lot of people say love. Yeah. Probably like. Yeah. 60%. Mm. Maybe more. So many people say it, right. But how many people like actually act upon that? 
Like, you know what I mean? I even think about it myself. I'm like, so I'm probably getting even a little bit emotional. Yeah, I'm like, true. I'm like, I'm like, that's actually it. Like it's, it's, that's what matters. Yeah. So it's like, got to do more of that for people. Anyway, yeah. it's weird. But anyway. okay. <laughs> How will you do the, more of that from here? If you take a lesson for this yeah. moment? I think it's, look, I, I definitely think I, I, I practice what I preach like with that. Like I can't, I've taken my mom out for dinner tonight. Like that really, yeah, it's really no. important to not miss those kind of moments. It was, it's her birthday. So yeah, no, happy birthday, mom. Happy birthday, mom. Exactly. <laughs> so like doing that and like just making sure that whatever your internal aspiration is, do not get so sucked in by that because your business will fucking consume you. Yeah. It will consume every aspect of you if you let it. So like just block out the shit. Well, sorry, don't block out the shit. Like block out time for what actually matters. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, it'll suck everything from you. Uh, and it can be really isolating. Like you probably know that, right? Yeah. Um, like better than me, right? Because you did your business by yourself, which would be fucking impossible for me mm. as, as an individual. Um, but yeah, I think like just make sure you block out what matters because you can, it can be very easy to be distracted by your ego, mm. by like your, your own aspirations and, and, and actually lose sight of maybe like what you're actually doing it for. Yeah. So come back to that and like, don't, yeah, don't get sucked into your own bullshit. Mm. Well, it's yeah. a- and you got to check that, right? Like I got to check that myself. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a constant check. Yeah. Just like every, every time you do something new, it's changing the way that you are. Mm. Are like approaching the world. Yeah, yeah. And then you got to be like, is this is this right? Are we are we on the right track? Yeah, and and, and like I think you know we're probably ranting and raving a little bit, <laughs> but um, like try and come back to your values, right? Like, what do you actually value? What do you like? And then try and where you can, like, don't just be obsessed with fucking making money. Like, yeah, I was gonna say, you I can don't make money. <laughs> 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 and strippers. <laughs> <laughs> Strippers, fast cars, and money. And like, darts. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love it. Right. <laughs> darts are fun. That's what I was meaning. No, um, but like, yeah, tr- try, try and do something good for the world, right? You yeah. can, you can do something that's good for the world, that's good for you, mm. that's you can make money from. It's like that. Look at this term, um, your ikigai. Yeah. If you heard of ikigai, is this Japanese concept that like you should that's what you should be spending your time on. There's an like a Venn diagram and an overlap of all those things. Yeah. And if you find that fucking do that and just don't stop doing that, it doesn't matter what's happening. So what is it? I'm going to butcher it, but it's like what, what you're naturally good at, what the world wants, what you can be paid for. And there's yeah. like one of the part of it. I yeah. can't remember. Anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. There's a, there's four. There's four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe we could like flash it up on the screen. <laughs> over here. Put in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Charlie, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate Thanks, your time and energy. Yeah, that was yeah. sick. That was good fun. Thank you, man. It was really fun. Of course. I'm yeah. glad it was. I, uh, we had a cool little moment at the end there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyone listening, if you like this or any of the other podcasts, like, subscribe and give it a rating. It really helps us. Yeah. Until next time. Please do. See you, man. What's up?